five. And I feel a deep sense of irresponsibility laughing about it because Why? It, Why? because I you know have to laugh. I. I let me just reassure all the woke lefty comics that their darkest fears aren't true yet. Three. We have a media class which just absolutely churns out this porn of doom every day. <laughs> every time a comic apologises for a joke when they don't mean it, I think an angel dies. One. We have left off. It's our weekly blast off and once again the cockpit controls are set for planet normal. As we speed along in this rocket of right thinking, this blessed capsule of common sense, what a mad world we're leaving behind. This is a Telegraph podcast with co-pilot Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. On last week's voyage, we welcomed former Supreme Court judge Jonathan Sumption to planet normal. After he highlighted the government's imposing lockdown measures under a law which prevents parliamentary scrutiny... Q widespread outcry. Meanwhile, the joys of the new rule of six, which the government hopes will keep everyone happy. But happy isn't allowed, because there are seven dwarfs, <laughs> and if they all got together, that would break the law. Maybe Snow White will inform on them, as ministers recommend, calling up the Wicked Witch. She's just got a job as a Covid marshal. Or maybe they can chuck out Grumpy from the grotto to make room. Or Sneezy, because he's clearly a Covid <laughs> super spreader. Let's stick him in a care home. But Alison, this is no fairy tale, right? Oh, goodness, Liam. Every week brings some fresh lunacy, doesn't it? Who would have thought that our own Conservative Party would end up doing outreach work for North Korea? I mean, you actually now... Seriously, this isn't a joke. You actually have police telling a group of mums and toddlers in the park that they have to break it up because a couple of the tiny children who won't suffer from COVID, as we know, and can't transmit it, took the size of the group over six. And Priti Patel, our Home Secretary, is actually seriously telling police that it's their job to enforce this rule of six which just is patently ludicrous. In Wales, in my own native Wales, you can still mix with 30 people out of doors. So shall I now move all our Christmas celebrations to my mum's so we can actually have more people than we can have in England? Um, And it's 15 in Northern Ireland, I think, right? 15 in Northern Ireland. And I I think it's a turning point, Liam, because I I think before people have been very compliant, they've gone along with a lot of things which are seem to have a lot of contradictions. But I think this is a turning point now, the rule of six. We've even had some of the Tory backbenchers who've been very, very quiet. Sir Graham Brady this week, chairman of the very influential 1922 Committee of Tory backbenchers saying it's peak infringement of people's liberties and their right to a normal family life. And you could mitigate quite considerably by excluding younger children from the rule of six, which is happening in Wales and Scotland. So uh, all, you know, general chaos and something that's really leapt out at me this week because of having a lot of friends with children in school, the schools thing has gone absolutely mental. You've got situations where one child's got a cough and two 200 pupils are sent home. Parents are then in quarantine for 14 days. I know of one family where the child tested negative and the parents were still told they had to quarantine for 14 days. How the hell are we going to get the economy back up and running, Liam, when families across the country could be exposed to random quarantine at any moment? Yeah, this is no fairy tale. It's not a joke. Businesses are are folding. Businesses that thought they may be able to survive lockdown have now been clobbered by this rule of six. And there's just, I think your interview last week with Jonathan Sumption was so well-timed because it was when somebody of his legal authority pointed out that the government is using a, a law that doesn't allow parliamentary scrutiny to impose these measures rather than a law uh, that does, a lot of people noticed that. And a lot of people noticed that in Westminster. And I think that has heightened uh, the concern of MPs as constituents keep telling them stories along the lines of what you've just heard. But, you know, we both agreed to adhere to the lockdown. We both talked about it a lot when Planet Normal got going during the lockdown, didn't we? You were always a bit more sceptical than me, but never did you... Uh, say, well, these rules are just mad. We shouldn't comply with them. And you've always complied with them. And I've always complied with them. But now it's just, you know, it's crazy. So you're allowed to meet up 
for a sporting event, right? <laughs> yes. But you're not allowed to meet up for dinner. So if, you know, come over to my house for Christmas dinner, Alison. We'll have the Pearsons and the Halligans together. Mm-hmm. And as long as we swap our Shoot knives and forks with table tennis bats, <laughs> then we'll be fine. <laughs> you know, let's string a table tennis net between the bread sauce and the turkey. <laughs> well, we can. I mean, yeah, let's have let's have grouse flying around the living room where we can sit there and shoot them as we eat dinner and that will be fine if, even if there's 30 of us i think i think <laughs> shoot, i think shooting the turkey for christmas dinner could could actually could really catch on in a big way we are allowed unbelievably we are allowed to have a hunting or a shooting party but not a seven-year-old's birthday party even though the seven-year-old will have been mixing that week in the same class with all the kids who would be invited to the birthday party. So I think the logical conclusion, Liam, is if we actually arm seven-year-olds with <laughs> with shotguns, then it, it'll be completely legal to have your seven-year-old's birthday party. You know, the fact we're laughing, but isn't it, doesn't oh. it show that once the kind of British sense of the ridiculous kicks in, and this is what we're having, there's been lots of things shared on social media of the Magnificent Seven being reduced to the Magnificent Six and, you know, uh, Enid Blyton's Secret Seven with George or Colin chucked out. So what's once those jokes... <laughs> Once those jokes start going, and we need jokes. We need jokes and we'll come to that. And, and we, we are laughing about it. And I feel a deep sense of irresponsibility laughing about it. because Why? You know, Why? Because I you know... I, I, no, we do have to laugh. But I know, I've, you know, people in my own life, my own family, countless emails from people reading columns, listening to Planet Normal. You know, so many businesses out there were hanging on. They were mm. pooling their life savings, their friends and family, the small, medium-sized enterprises that employ most people in this country, that drive most growth in this country. And they were houses were being remortgaged and they thought we could get through this. And then suddenly, clobber, the rule of six comes in, in such a, you know, I'm not saying we don't need to take additional measures as and when there are spikes in cases and fatalities. And we can talk talk about the distinction between the two can't we yes but it's so blunt it's so broad brush you know the the the, this virus does discriminate the government was always wrong to have its doom laden messages the virus does not discriminate it does discriminate if you're already sick with a condition that affects your immunity and if you're elderly unfortunately you have a much much higher chance of both catching and suffering and even dying from this virus. If you're below 50, the chances are very, 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 very low that you're going to have serious symptoms or indeed any symptoms. And so why aren't these new measures recognising these realities? Well, on the day that the rule of six came in, there was one hospital death in England from COVID. One. Okay. so is this a proportionate reaction to what's going on? They're now testing the healthy. Why on earth are they wasting time and money testing the healthy? I mean, you had to laugh when Boris talked about Project Moonshot. I mean, Matt Hancock would have trouble organising a charabank to Mablethorpe, you know, wouldn't he? I mean, the testing's terrible. I know you you love the bit of the podcast where I come in with my Velma from Scooby-Doo fact finding. (laughs) (laughs) So let's just say the latest Office for National Statistics figures, and they are the most reliable. Lots of the other graphs are totally unreliable, but they show that flu and pneumonia have contributed to far more weekly deaths than COVID-19 since the middle of June. Just 1% of deaths now mentioned. That's velmatastic. I did not know that. That's unbelievable. just 1% of deaths now mention COVID as a cause on the death certificate, and that's compared to 12.8%, which mention flu and pneumonia. And this is really important, Liam, given the totally draconian measures which we've now got stopping families associating with each other, stopping people talking to each other in the street, if you please, that the number of overall deaths has plummeted to well below the five-year seasonal average for England and Wales. We have got 1,443 fewer deaths in the most recent weekly figures, Okay, So we are down on the year. It may well be by the end of the year that we have average annual mortality. And what have we done across the the entire country 
across the whole yes across the whole year we may not be ahead on deaths and that is astonishing when you think we're kind of two trillion quid down and 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 you know we are well down now the figures are well down and they are persisting I mean how many times just drives me absolutely nuts so they'll always say oh you'll see in two weeks you'll see in two weeks time what will happen there'll be that second wave so it's B day just wait for two weeks Bournemouth beach crowded just wait for two weeks Black Lives Matter protests oh just wait for two weeks waiting for two more weeks and it never ever comes this second wave and there is no sign in the hospitals or in the death figures of any second wave so we're basing this on on an entirely fictitious entity which as you say would be funny were it not for the fact that you know there's a a local catering company I use from time to time they were clinging on for that Christmas trade Liam they were waiting to do drinks parties office parties people like that are going to lose everything for what for 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 the rule of six snitch on your neighbor a rule which by the way don't mingle don't mingle we're not we're not allowed to get together are we Professor Carl Hannigan of Oxford University, one of the sanest commentators, okay, he says the rule of six policy was catastrophic and had no scientific evidence to support it, warning that the measure could be the one that tips the British public over the edge. And I totally agree with him. You've outdone us all, Alison. Really interesting statistics. Astonishing that those statistics, given... Given the public interest in those statistics, given how vital they are to our national debate, those statistics have not been on the mainstream broadcast news. And that's a disgrace, given how many journalists they've got sitting around doing their Ricardo orders during office hours. These statistics are easy to find. You've dug them up. You've got a DNO level maths and you've reported <laughs> them accurately all right, um, all right. and fairly. Uh, and they they should be screaming them from the rooftops. Ministers should be screaming them from the rooftops. Why are we in this place? I think we're largely in this place due to a combination, and it's it's us lot and our ilk, Alison, who are to blame, due to the political and media class in this country. We are incapable of having a proper factually based debate that doesn't immediately lead to massive finger pointing mudslinging and assumptions on all sides of bad faith we seem to be incapable of engendering a style of political leadership where people can say as mervyn king said remember mervyn mm, king on planet yeah, normal brilliant i don't know but it's your job to know how can i know no one knows you know i don't know but this is what i think and this is what we're going to try and we're going to monitor it and keep you informed, is a fabulous way to lead a country and win respect. And the only way to really make decisions and to really forge a way through in a period of what's called radical uncertainty, when you've got lots of known unknowns and unknown unknowns and new facts coming to light all the time, and scientists, frankly, you know, understandably arguing about the facts because the data collection is so different in different jurisdictions and there's such a lag with it. The only way to make proper headway in a period of radical uncertainty is what we call iteratively, you know, make lots of small decisions rather than one massive decision, which then you must stick to. Otherwise, it's a U-turn. It's a U-turn. Big problem in our political leadership. And it stems not just from the kind of people that go into politics. It stems from the way the, the media covers politics and policy too. And that does not mean that we must all be you know, compliant. My God, I've kicked loads of ministerial shins in my lifetimes and got ministers sacked with my journalism. And I know you have and, and given people serious criticism when they've deserved it. But you also have to realise that there are human beings here trying to make decisions under the most difficult circumstances. And yet we always, always, always assume bad faith. Yes, but what we do know is we know that really complex laws have been drafted in secret and released just literally hours before they come into force, yep. causing huge confusion to the public and to the police who are supposed to enforce laws that have literally the ink has barely dried on them. You know, Pretty Patel, the Home Secretary, you'd expect her to have a grasp of the laws that she's telling everyone else to kind of abide by. She popped up on the radio the other day, you know, with the don't mingle with people. It's illegal to mingle with people if you bump into a group of friends on the way to the park. And then there's a leading lawyer 
online absolutely saying that is not what the legislation says. So you've actually got the Home Secretary giving giving the wrong information. And we are not having this. We are not having enough people in Parliament holding people to account. And one of my bugbears, Liam, I have to say is they're all quick, aren't they, to get on their hind legs when it's something to do with, oh, we mustn't be nasty to the European Union. Oh, no, we might be, you know, we might be breaking international law. Never mind, you know, scuppering the civil liberties of 66 million people. There's not there's not a bat squeak out of them. And that really, really annoys me. But I do agree with you that we have a media class which just absolutely churns out this, you know, the pawn of doom every day, you know, ooh, you know. <laughs> Three and a half thousand more cases. Everyone's dying in Bolton. And then you find out the figures for what's happening in Bolton Hospital. There's absolutely no sign of anybody dying. So what we should be doing, as Carl Hennigan has said, as Lord Sumption has said, we should be looking at the only thing that matters with our hospitalizations increasing, our deaths increasing. If they're not, people should just be allowed to get on with their lives. And obviously, if there's a particular spike in infections in some areas, which which we could say is primarily down to uh, extra testing if there is then fair enough take some local measures we even had the archbishop of canterbury who's been in a a tomb of silence during this whole pandemic (laughs) saying to the telegraph today came out of his catafalque to uh to finally say that this is having a destructive effect on families this is really really bad justin welby you know said why not go local? You know, if the, if the, this is what other countries are doing. Can I just point out that Planet Normal, rather astonishingly, now turns out to be Germany, where they are about to reopen football stadiums with full crowds. There are Frankfurt Airport is working properly. People get off a plane. You have a swab. The test result is given quickly. They don't have any of these international quarantines, which are absolutely wrecking our uh, airport, airline and hospitality industry. Why are we so lumbering and behind the curve, Liam? So let's turn to this week's Planet Normal guest. We need a laugh. The BBC (laughs) has a new boss, Tim Davey, as we've mentioned before. And he says he recognises that BBC comedy is too woke to use the vernacular of our day, too imbued with so-called metropolitan liberal values and patronising to big chunks of the population, too left-wing, increasingly not very funny. One seasoned comedy circuit regular tip to benefit is Jeff Norcott, a sharp comic who has his own podcast called What Most People Think, and he's admitted to sometimes voting Conservative. Jeff grew up on a council estate in South London got himself a degree from Goldsmith College in New Cross, which former students have been known to proudly describe not so much as dreaming spires, but screaming (laughs) tyres, given that the BBC will soon be booking Jeff for a lot more TV appearances, maybe his own show, I asked him if he'd ordered a new yacht. That was the news I was told a couple of weeks ago, and my wife heard that news as well. We've remortgaged. It's time for a new kitchen. Yeah, I hope that's not being a little bit uh, getting ahead of ourselves here. But yeah, it it was one of the funny things about that process was the idea that I could suddenly get just just any passing idea, you know, any fever dream I'd had or, or any daydream, I could just get it commissioned. I can assure you, and I can't be too specific, but I've got actual evidence that that is not the case from very recently so put it another way let me just reassure all the woke lefty comics that their darkest fears aren't true yet the thing that i've learned about television is that there's always this perception that the representation issues with it come from the top and actually they don't like the people at the top of the bbc all understand this problem right because they see the big figures right they see that they're more importantly than anything people want to talk about politics it's to do with class as well they've been losing their working class audience because you know, like, there's not that many shows that directly speak to them. And I think working class people, we're more blunt in the way that we communicate. And that doesn't always sit well with politically sensitive comedy. So I think that the the desire is earnest, you know, with the commissioners and all that. Problem is, is once you get down the line to production companies, you're then talking about Metropolitan 30 something. They're not as troubled about the BBC's representation issues for working class people or Brexit voters or Tory voters. They want to make the kind of television they want to make, and which is, that's fine for them to have that ambition. I think the problem is, is when you're doing it on licence fee, pay and money, <laughs> there is this unique thing that it's, it's not an option for the BBC to not have some sort of exchange value for that audience. Do you hear me there using exchange value? This is someone who's sat in too many diversity panel meetings, mate. I never knew that word. 
up until a year ago. I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> exchange value. Well, it's just like, here's, here's, here's my money. Here's a program you like. Exchange value. There you go. God, what's happened to me? <laughs> we're pretty good at comedy, aren't we, the Brits? Do you think we're in danger of losing our skill at laughing at ourselves and each other? It's a skill that's got us through many tough times over yeah. many generations. I think it's a really dangerous thing, given the psyche of this nation. And when I say that, I mean everyone in it. I mean black, Asian, white, you know, I think no one's immune from having the piss taken out of them. It's really important that people aren't excluded. And also, if, you know, people working in liberal ivory towers want to make the decision on behalf of people that they can't handle some light piss taking, that is also dangerous because then you're excluding people from the conversation, right? Mm. There's a show I saw recently that I really liked, a sketch show called uh, Famalam. I didn't know much about it, and then, but it really went for the funny. And, you know, it had a very diverse cast, but it also mocked everyone within those communities as well. And that's why it's a success. And, you know, that show got into trouble in itself, predominantly black performers for their portrayal of Jamaicans in particular. So it just goes to show that, you know, there's always that line when you attempt to be funny where you risk getting tripped up. But, yeah, family, and what I liked about it was like, yeah, they're actually taking the risk of going for jokes. And I think that comedy is such an amazing export. I, I tell you something, you know, the EU have got a lot of cards on their table, but uh, comedy is not a huge export, is it? Let's, I, I suspect they're probably stockpiling Monty Python as we speak. And <laughs> it's the backstop against Monty Python. <laughs> yeah, they probably, they're, they're smart, the EU. They've probably been doing this for about two years. You suddenly find just mountains of old British comedy DVDs uh, <laughs> so, somewhere in Strasbourg. But yeah, it's, it's something to be really, really proud of. It's a defence mechanism for us. And, and so it's really anathema to the public mood to, to kind of shut down too many angles for creativity, really. How do you feel when you sit at home watching a lot of the comedy that we see on our mainstream television channels these days? Does it make you sad? I'll be honest, there's not a huge amount that I will watch. You know, I, I was raised on the club circuit, right? the weekend stag and hen circuit from the mid noughties onwards. And then yeah. that was like, get out there, 20 minutes. What are your best jokes, right? Have two punchlines per minute. So I like sitcoms and shows that have a higher joke turn up. So that does lead you to more towards the American style shows like 30 Rock or Seinfeld or Family Guy, you know, the sort of joke machine guns. Yeah. Having said that, my, my friend Catherine Ryan has just dropped a show, The Duchess, on Netflix, and it has that in it. And it's a very British show. She's been here a long time. But that's what I love about it. And that's why it's doing so well. People like things they can quote as well. Too many sitcoms for me now. They're just a bit middle class and all the jokes seem to come from awkward pauses. There is nothing funny about an awkward pause. <laughs> you could have left an awkward pause in there just to sort of underline the point. <laughs> I, I, I could have done, but then but then I'd be you, Jeff, and I'm not in your league. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up watching, um, like a lot of Planet Normal listeners, the two Ronnies and Porridge, Mike Yarwood. Was that the golden age of British comedy? I remember watching Dave Allen with my mum. Oh, and, and brilliant. Just thinking, well, I mean, you know, you know, when you remember stuff, you go, oh, yeah, I just thought this guy's got it all. No, I didn't. I was a teenager. I didn't think like that. But looking back now, genius on his comedy, re watching some of his routines. And for an Irishman to take on the Catholic Church the way he did, exactly. was astonishingly you know, risky at the time. Well, this was the thing was he was subversive when he wanted to be, and then he told an observational bit when he wanted to. And I think that's always been the same with my star. I mean, I'm, I'm going back out on tour soon, he said, dropping the big plug. But, you know, the show is called Taking Liberties. It's about nanny state and intervention but if i suddenly think about a routine between the difference between men and women i'll do it if i suddenly think of an observation about the way that men look into a fridge like it has answers <laughs> i'll do it because and then you go back 30 seconds later and it's the same answer <laughs> <laughs> ham the answer is always ham and so yeah he i think he he had it he had it all you know Ronnie Barker, I think Rick, people like Ricky Gervais, Coogan, there are always people that come through like this. The, the, the fear is, and I, and I don't think it's just people like me go, well, you can't say nothing no more. There is a genuine worry that, that that kind of talent would struggle to get through now because of the kind of minefield you have to navigate, or they end up on Netflix or other streaming services who are willing to take more risks. But you can't say anything anymore, can you? I mean, that's the truth of it. No, I mean, I, I try to avoid extremes. I, I don't I don't think that you can't say anything more. I think that the repercussions for saying stuff are perhaps a bit more acute than they've been for some time, right? Is So, like, you, you think, okay, even if before you do a tweet, you have to sort of calibrate, how much time can I waste dealing with idiotic responses to this? Um, <laughs> so you can, you can say it, and the repercussions might be there. I think in some ways for performers, you know, I mean, 
People talk about cancel culture. It's fair to say that a lot of the people that have had controversies haven't been fully cancelled and are still around. But it's a bit of a misnomer because really the issue for me, and I get a lot of this on my podcast, what me, most people think is people write in saying, I said something at work and now I'm being disciplined or I'm being suspended. Actually, mm. cancel culture for me is a shame that it's been misappropriated because it really refers to people who are having racial awareness training, you know, or people who made one poor decision or said something out of line. That is where it's really important is in the modern workplace. The amount of people that write into me who work at universities that don't want me to read their name out, it's depressing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it might just be a thing because they know deep down that I'm a bit shit, but that, they certainly tell me that it's to do with political <laughs> there, there is that possibility. <laughs> Hello, I'm Katie Morley and I'm the Telegraph's consumer champion. It's a big job title, but what it really means is I spend my days helping readers who are being ripped off. I've heard from victims of wicked scams, insurance customers who can't get payouts and customers who've been treated badly by retailers. I've seen it all and I've managed to win back over two million pounds for our readers in a year. But I couldn't have done it without our subscribers. And that's where you come in. If you subscribe to The Telegraph, you're helping fund public service journalism like this, as well as great podcasts like the one you're listening to. So to support what we're doing and to get unlimited access to a huge range of world-class journalism, head to telegraph.co.uk slash audio, where you can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph online. And after that, it's just £2 a week. That's telegraph.co.uk slash audio or click on the link in the show notes to this episode. What do you make of this critique that's been around for years, but it's come to the fore again since the BBC said it wanted to go for more comics who weren't just knee-jerk left-wing? This idea that comedy has to punch up in society. So the idea of a comic who isn't left wing is sort of a, a misnomer. Well, I think that it's just become way too simplistic. You know, you just think of the concept of power. That's all you need to think of. Who has it, right? So yeah. you think of cultural institutions obviously have power. You know, you look at social media has power. There are companies that have removed products based on a tiny amount of tweets. They're quite cowardly in essence. They give in to something and then that creates a bigger backlash and they're sort of seeding the culture war by not having any backbone themselves. So I, I don't yeah. think you can just boil down power to one thing, political power. You know, there's small p politics as well. And the great thing about having a variety of comedic voices isn't just about, I don't think, having conservative voices. You, you want someone, a comedian there, and, you know, it might only be one out of seven comics, but someone who might just have a different view. So if you're in a discussion of Churchill, I would suspect that most left-wing comics wouldn't, you know, be rushing to be seen to stand up for his legacy. Whereas I think that a right of centre or perhaps a more, more small C conservative might go into that area. Along with about 70% of the population. Well, of course. It's, I mean, this is why I called the podcast what most people think, because actually exactly. I benefit from this. This is what makes me laugh, is that I get to seem edgy by just dealing in incredibly common opinions. You know, <laughs> So I always say at the start of the tour shows, it's like strap yourselves in for some stuff that you might have already considered. <laughs> I think... I think you're right about the punch up, punch down thing, given where cultural power is. And it is largely in institutions that take a left wing point of view. I think the woke culture is ripe for satire. It should, we should be ripping it to pieces. And I also think a lot of left wing comics have been punching down for years when they tell working people who are concerned about access to council services and all the rest of it, who voted Brexit, perhaps, that they're racist. I mean, that is one of the worst possible examples of punching down on people by trust and left-wing comics on ordinary working people. I also think that the, you know, taking the mickey out of uh, holier than now, because the thing about the words like virtue signaling is people say, well, that's a word that's made up by the right. And you go, well, what about sanctimonious then? It means the same thing. That's been around since the 12th century. Yeah. This is a facet of human behaviour 
that you, you're essentially putting yourself on a pedestal. And there's only one way to go when you're on a pedestal, right? And it's happened before in British comedy. If you look at Rick from The Young Ones, what a brilliant character. You know, he sort of <laughs> underpinned. <Fascist. laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, Thatcher out and, you know, he had all the badges. But it, essentially, yeah. his, his anti-establishment sentiments, we all knew that they were skin deep, right? And he was just basically rebelling against mummy and daddy. It took a shot all around. You wouldn't get The Young Ones now, would you? The Young Ones would be just eviscerated by executives worried about offending people. I think I think now is the problem is is certain um it's called being adjacent with an opinion, isn't it? So I'm sure there are loads and loads of comedians who have issues with the extreme ends of woke culture, but it's seen that if you critique it, that puts you on the same platform as people on the right. This thing about being fascist adjacent or if you speak to somebody who you disagree with. Yeah. So I think maybe that's the problem is if you were party to a sketch that appeared to mock the woke, that would be well, do I sympathise with the all right? You go, no, I just think that, you know, people who seek to impose quite narrow and niche sort of liberal uh, preconceptions upon other people are, are there for the, the taking and they always have been. What do you want to happen now in terms of British comedy? What are we at risk of losing here, Jeff, if we don't regain our ability to make fun in a good natured way, but a cutting way sometimes of each other, of ourselves, of those who govern us? Well, I, d I don't really think it's going to go away. I just think it's changed form. So th what the real risk, I think, is that mainstream broadcasters miss out because other people will go elsewhere, right? It's already happening. People will go to podcasts. People go to YouTube. They'll go to streaming services. So it would just be a shame that not as many people will know about it. You remember that that binding thing we had of all the great sketch shows and characters like Harry Enfield? Yeah, I mean, it was the it was kids talking about them in the playground yeah. the next day. Can we have those kind of national events sort of, comedians really getting into the public's consciousness even though we don't have tv channels that get that kind of audience anymore because everybody's going digital i think that's a problem for all entertainment to be honest i mean the only ones that seem to kind of exceed that rule is dramas you know <laughs> the pole dark said as well maybe if comedians all got massive six packs all right that's and it. we all set our act in downton abbey or something like that i i think that unfortunately i think it's a it's a bloody shame that that we don't have those moments. You know, like Catherine Tate, again, it was at that period of time where someone said, these are a bunch of people that you'll all recognise in Britain now. Yeah. But it, it's just hard to get those. And also, producers become risk averse. All you need is a couple of sketch shows that don't work. And, and you know, and also, when you're in a marketplace against streaming services and YouTube that can be way more blunt in subject matter and language, you're, you're at a natural, it's a handicap, it's a natural disadvantage to begin with. Is there anything you wouldn't joke about, Jeff? No, not really. If I thought of a good enough joke about something, I would joke about it. The worst thing is, is when you get dragged for a joke and you know that the main reason was because it was a bad joke, that's what's annoying. It doesn't ever worry me about what I said because, you know, this importance that's given to things that people tweet, you think, you know, I was sitting on the bog, I was having a dump and a thought occurred to me and I tweeted it. And this mortal importance that is accorded to these things are just... So excessive. But, you know, the one thing you are accountable for as a comic is, was it funny? I'll tell you one thing I never do, I'll never do, is I'll never explain a joke or apologise for it. I think that every time a comic apologises for a joke when they don't mean it, I think an angel dies. Amen to that. Awkward pause. <laughs> <laughs> Andy mentioned Paul Dark, Alison, your favourite. He did. You know, I absolutely love that interview. I mean, I really want to see Jeff's show having listened to that. I mean, what he's on to, Liam, really, isn't it, is that British comedy used to be about equal opportunities mockery, didn't it? it yeah. The, the classic Englishman, Irishman, Welshman, Scotsman go into a bar. It was that difference is funny, but it doesn't mean that difference is about hatred. And that's what it's become about now. It's hate speech, isn't it? And it used to be about being funny. One of my favourite comedians of all time is Victoria Wood, who, you know, a great genius taken from us much too soon. And looking back, I think some of her sketches now, would she be attacked on Twitter? In Dinner Ladies, lovely sitcom she did on the telly, and the really thick girl in the Dinner Ladies was, was the Asian on the end. And somebody asked her about that, and she said, she said, well, they can't all be maths geniuses, can they? And, uh, and again, it was, it was a love of humanity. She's a perfect planet normal person, Victoria Wood. She had this great generous spirit, but saw humour 
in you know everywhere in pretense and so on and, and as Jeff mentioned you know the great Dave Allen how much of his stuff would be allowed on now Jeff's got his own podcast what most people think which I've enjoyed listening to and he's got his upcoming tour fingers crossed taking liberties I feel I should just mention for the benefit of listeners who aren't real comedy aficionados he mentioned Coogan that's Steve Coogan who did Alan Partridge the Young Ones a series I grew up watching in the 80s with uh, Rick Mail and Aid Edmondson Alexi Sale a real path-breaking comedy on the BBC it must be said you know fair enough amazingly culturally influential show uh, I think a really important point that Jeff made and I don't think even though he is massively talented I, I don't foresee the BBC suddenly giving people from Jeff's neck of the woods, if you like. I sincerely hope he gets a really big break from the BBC and I think he deserves it, but I don't see a sea change happening, I'm afraid. Uh, I mean, I want it to happen. Do you not? We'll wait, we'll I, wait and see. I think we should wait and, and wait and see. I, I suspect that the, that the penny has dropped. We've just had the news that the BBC licence fee was paid by 250,000 fewer people in the last year. Liam, that, you know, box office is starting to go down. And I, I, let's just see, I, Jeff made the very interesting point, didn't he, that some of the execs at the top understand that this diversity, not just diversity of, of colour and religion and so on, but, you know, diversity of politics and, and, and background really matters. Yeah. And, and, and he said, and I'm not going to gainsay him, he knows his business a lot, a lot better than me. But look, I've been involved in this world myself a bit as well you know the independent producers who make many of these programs pitch what they know the commissioners want the commissioners really do have the power so we'll see if it comes from the top look tim davy the bbc guy he says he's going to make changes and bbc stars so-called going to be reined in on twitter he says that and gary lineker who up until recently, he got 1.75 million quid a year for reading out a few links on television about football. You know, now he's going to take a pay cut of a quarter. So what, 1.3 million? Uh, nice work if you can get it. Tim Davy said, oh, our big stars are going to rein themselves in on Twitter and they're not going to be so opinionated. And Gary Lineker just t- tweeted, nah, mm-hmm. N-A-H, mm-hmm. exclamation mark. Yeah, I mean, it shows contempt, doesn't it, for the public? And I think everyone will be astonished this week at a time when the BBC is reimposing the licence fee on the over 75. So, you know, many people very, very poor and um, and struggling. And then we've got all the the salaries of the BBC stars paid. And Zoe Ball, I think everyone's jaws will have dropped, got a one million pay rise despite losing a million listeners since replacing Chris Evans on the Radio 1 Breakfast Show last year. I mean... I can't think of many occupations, Liam, in which um, such conspicuous uh, failure is rewarded with such stonking sums of money. Well, it just shows that the BBC is an extension of the civil service, isn't it? That's the culture. You get demoted upward. <laughs> These people are effectively public servants. I've got a, a great friend who works for the BBC and she always says, why should uh, senior people at the BBC be paid more than the Prime Minister, who is the most important public servant? So you've got these vastly inflated salaries at a time when people are, you know, people are going to be hitting hard times. And this week there was, a, there was another example of disrespect for the audience with the question of sport, um, where the presenters of Question of Sport, a very, very well-loved, you know, 25-year-old more show on BBC One and Sue Barker, age 64, Phil Tufnell, age 54, Matt Dawson, age 47, were, you know, ignominiously chucked off this show. And I would say, if you think about someone like Sue Barker, she's she's slightly older than I am, Liam. Sue Barker, probably the vast majority of BBC One viewers are white females around the age of 64. And they, what do they do? They get rid of Sue Barker, even though she's extremely good at her job. Sue's um, predecessor in the chair, of course, was the immortal David Coleman. Oh, and yeah. I'm sure Brilliant. I'm sure Planet Normal listeners will remember Coleman, not least for his wonderful Coleman balls during his sports commentary. I think the, the one I'll remember till my dying day was it was, I don't know which Olympics it would have been, but I think it was the 400 metres. And Coleman said, I can't do the accent, Liam, he said, and Juan Torino opens his legs and shows his class. <laughs> The Coleman ball became a generic term, didn't it, for whenever 
whenever a sports commentator says something that was ridiculous. The batsman's holding, the bowler's willy. The bowler's <laughs> willy, absolutely. But, you know, what, what the BBC are getting rid of, you know, very recently, Ian Botham, David Gower, Clive Tilsley, Phil Thompson, all of these are people in middle age or late middle age and precisely the kind of people that people enjoy. And I, I, and I know that a lot of Planet Normal listeners have said, I mean, they're now talking about a more diverse panel for question of sport, you know, possibly bringing in some, you know, different people from ethnic minority backgrounds. But it's it's not that people don't want diversity, Liam, they enjoy it. But why the diversity of age, as you say, of experiences that we've all shared, it's as though they won't rest until British culture is stripped of all the things that many of us like. This week, of course, our tortured Brexit negotiations have really cranked back up. Boris Johnson is insisting if there's no free trade agreement by mid-October with the EU, then the UK will simply stop negotiating and will leave in January with no trade deal. They seem to have got themselves in a right legal mess, don't they, Alison? Yes, I mean, I find it very difficult, Liam, to follow all the ins and outs. I mean, I just wonder what the MPs are doing, you know, arguing against a contingency plan, you know, which will prevent the free import of food to Northern Ireland. I mean, as far as I can understand it, the withdrawal agreement was signed in the hope that the EU wouldn't abuse those provisions. And the EU, in its negotiating strategy, has shown every sign that it's perfectly willing to abuse those provisions. So the UK, first of all, gave the EU the benefit of the doubt. And I think Boris is now saying we can't rely on them not to do the dirty on us. Would would, would that be a good layperson's analysis of it? I think you've captured the essence of it well. It is very, very twisty, this story. Um, There are lots and lots of people pointing fingers and simplistically, in my view, saying they're breaking international law. But then again, Brandon Lewis, the Northern Ireland Secretary, said exactly that in a bold statement that will go on, be printed on T-shirts and become almost a rallying cry against the UK from the Commons dispatch box. It was almost as if the government was deliberately trying to stoke up some kind of huge row. And I don't think it necessarily needed to do that. There's always going to be massive, massive tensions in any negotiation. There's always going to be finger pointing and mudslinging when the stakes are so high, particularly when negotiations are carried out in the the, the citadel, if you like, of public opinion by elected politicians, at least elected politicians on one side of the negotiating table. If we actually signed a free trade agreement with the European Union, then a lot of these problems would disappear. And the reason we're not signing a free trade agreement with the European Union is because the one that they offered us, the so-called Canada Plus model, something that they've already given to Canada, Japan, Norway, if we take elements of those free trade deals, they have offered us uh, that kind of a free trade deal in the past. And Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, has got this famous slide where it's actually got a Canada flag with a big green tick next to it in terms of the deal we could do yet they're not now giving us that deal because they want from the UK continued exact access under the same terms as now when we're in the EU to UK fishing waters and you know about a third of fish caught in British waters are are, are, are caught by British vessels so two-thirds aren't they want to have this um, so-called level playing field where the UK has to continue to adhere to EU restrictions and regulations, not just now, but when they change in the future, even though we have no say over the changes that are made. And to force continued governance by the European Court of Justice, which is something... Well, that is the big enchilada, the the, the European Court of Justice, which is widely seen around the world for what it is. It's a political court. (laughs) It's a quasi-legal body. In its own Articles of Association, it promotes the interests of the European Union. It's not an objective body. Uh, and for all these reasons, the British government's saying no, and they're exactly right to say no. I can remember during the, in the run up to the referendum, interviewing James Dyson, who had Yeah, the businessman, yeah. The businessman, the great, one of our great entrepreneurs. And Dyson had some very salty things to say about European justice, because he said, you know, you'd, you'd design some clever new vacuuming thing um, 
and then it would be you know oh no and it was down to Mr Mealy and Mr Bosch the Italians and the Germans who they'd be given the thumbs up and any British designer god help you you know Liam something that really jumped out at me this week I thought one of the great quotes of the week was from Andrew Neil on Twitter and he said when it comes to the EU the British media's default position is to treat anything the UK government does as a deceit lie obfuscation matter for doubt while treating anything out of Brussels as gospel when did you last see a Barnier type given a tough interview I mean doesn't that say it all really about our media rooting for the other side Andrew's exactly right and isn't it nice that sort of post BBC Andrew Neil he really can get his mm. kit off if you like <laughs> pardon, <laughs> yeah. the, pardon the image um, yeah. and and say more of what he thinks because what he thinks reflects what an awful lot of people think across the country the EU systematically refused to comply with international law for years with judgments from the World Trade Organization it's flouted rules on GMO crops hormone beef Airbus subsidies there's a fabulous article along these lines by our Telegraph colleague, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, I can highly recommend it. And we know that the EU for years has tried to use Ireland as a, some kind of bargaining chip, some kind of negotiating leverage. You know, there's actually there's actually a video, isn't it? Yeah, there's, there's, was caught, caught on video abs- saying, absolutely. Wait, wait to see how we're going to, you know, if, if, if Britain's going to be like this, we're going to use Ireland against them. He literally says that. He literally says that. And he literally says, we're going to leave this issue open. We have to be uh, careful about the reaction because he knows this is so sensitive. So for commercial gain, and this is all about commercial gain, they want to keep Britain in the EU's customs union. They want to keep money going from the UK to the EU, even though we're going to be an independent country and they are using here the threat of provoking sectarian violence on the Irish border. They are literally trying to pick at the scab of very tortured relations between the UK and Ireland over many years, which of course I feel personally very, very deeply given my background. And we've got to a point where relations between the UK and Ireland are pretty much the best they've ever been. And then the British public vote for Brexit. That's their democratic right to vote for that. And the EU is using uh, the, the, the fragility of those relations in order to try and impose on Britain an agreement and not give us a free trade deal that it's given to many, many, many other countries. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I totally agree. It was interesting, wasn't it, to see Nigel Farage popping up this week and saying that, you know, as he hinted to us before on Planet Normal, saying the withdrawal agreement is not the Brexit we voted for. Boris misled us, but now with his latest round of discussions is trying to make amends. MPs who voted for Brexit in name only, do you remember the old Brino, will will see campaigns launched against them in their seats by a revived Brexit party. Now, I thought that was a very interesting development. I did. I don't agree with Nigel Farage on this, I'm afraid. I don't think Boris misled us. I think the face of the the, the withdrawal agreement as it stands, there is language in there which requires the EU to act in a reasonable and neighbourly manner. Mm. There is language in there which indicates that the EU should be doing everything it can to secure a free trade agreement. And we already had that public pledge from Barnier made many, many times that a Canada-style free trade agreement was on the table. So I think Nigel there is being opportunistic. Fair, You know, that's, that's, that's his right. He's a very canny politician. But I don't think it's fair to say that Boris didn't understand the withdrawal agreement. I know from talking to many people close to the process throughout over many months and years that the UK has been across the detail. And now I think it's fair to say the EU is acting in a way which totally blows out of the water any claim that they can have to be acting in good faith. I think the the thing that cheers me up is our negotiator, David Frost, seems to be you know seems to be actually on a, on on the side of britain which is a which is a bit of a development a bit of a, a bit of a step forward liam from the from the theresa may team of negotiators who occasionally seem to be batting for the other side and frankly if these so-called permanent secretaries want to leave in a blaze of glory timing their superannuated retirements to impose maximum damage on the UK government's negotiating position, desperate to get some tawdry deal so they can write their memoirs, which no one will read, by the way, (laughs) then they can go. Bye. 
So let's have some reader emails. Lots and lots of you are mailing us at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. And the emails have mushroomed this week because Liam and I wrote our first Planet Normal column in Monday's Telegraph on the way, well on the way, Halligan and Pearson to world domination. It's only a matter of time. (laughs) The Planet Normal column will appear every Monday from now on and we will be featuring the things that you've written to us and emailed us about. So here's one email that caught my eye. This is from Victoria, a very frustrated mother. One week back at school to the day and an entire year group has been sent home to isolate for two weeks. How is this sustainable? What about working parents? What about our children's mental health? Here's one from Robert who wrote in to say, As a retired GP, I'd like to add my voice to your accounts of our failing national COVID service with more evidence of the chaos that reigns in the real world. My wife has rheumatoid arthritis. She takes immunosuppressive drugs, which carry risks of side effects. Prior to COVID, these side effects were monitored by three monthly visits to hospital and monthly blood tests. Once this COVID hysteria started, NHS England scrapped the hospital appointments and waived the blood tests. On what clinical grounds? I have no idea. At the end of May, I felt the blood test should still be done, so I contacted our GP surgery, who by then had locked the doors. The upshot was that if I collected the kit and took the blood samples myself, they'd send the sample off for testing. What about those people in the same boat who aren't married to a GP? Robert then goes on to tell us about a succession of cancelled hospital appointments. On the 2nd of September, a letter arrived offering a telephone conversation on the 28th of October. On the 3rd of September, a letter arrived cancelling the telephone appointment and booking a face-to-face clinic on December the 16th. On the 4th of September, a letter arrived cancelling the clinic appointment and offering a telephone appointment on the 30th of December. Utter chaos. Utter chaos. Yeah, and people really suffering. I thought it was really interesting, Liam, that this week the government finally kind of pulled itself together and told GPs that they were going to have to give patients face-to-face appointments or face being investigated. And the Royal College of GPs hit back, listen to this, Liam, saying it was an insult to suggest GPs had not been doing their job properly. Well, not as much of an insult as readers and listeners like the one you just read out, who've actually seen their families and, you know, been in... Tri- We've had so many emails and How many about- have we had, Alison? Oh, not so just I- dozens, right? I mean... Well, I've had, I'd say several hundred emails. Well, I've had over a thousand emails to my Telegraph account from people with, you know, stories that make you just weep. And I think finally, it's interesting that the government is finally saying you've got to do your job. And we've talked about this so much on Planet Normal, haven't we? The supermarket workers, the delivery drivers, people have just had to get on with their jobs. And too often the white collar tranche of society has felt it's okay to kind of sit back and it absolutely isn't and Professor Carol Sakura who was a guest on Planet Normal a few weeks ago has warned again this week that this is such a disaster for cancer cases coming down the line and I think it will be the great scandal of the next few years. Here's one from Karen. Dear Alison and Liam it seems that university libraries are closing I'm a former teacher and the whole thing is utterly staggering, as well as the statement from the National Union of Teachers that teachers don't feel safe going into a classroom. Who on earth ever thought they were safe in a classroom? People are naturally risky. You know this as a teacher. You get delightful students who ask challenging questions, who touchingly help others. You get others who use you as an emotional punch bag. There's no risk-free strategy at all in this life especially in occupations which involve that most delightful of wild cards, people. Great email. Wonderful email. And this is from Kate. Regarding the rule of six, the prospect of my brother who lives alone and a two-hour drive away from other family members having nowhere to go at Christmas is hugely upsetting. He, like my husband and myself, is over 70 and normally we team up with my daughter, her husband and two sons. While all the age ranges mentioned are no doubt relevant and critical in terms of COVID threat, we, the septuagenarians, are happy to take our chances. We would all prefer to die from COVID than end up gaga in some old folks home. As it is, we will be six instead of seven, but just as vulnerable to the potentially youthful members of our group. On the other hand, my brother might just possibly turn up unexpectedly. And would he be turned away on Christmas Day? I think not. But in any case, I would gladly pay the fines for all concerned. Shh, don't tell the COVID marshals. 
Wow. There's going to be a lot it, of people, gonna... Liam, with that attitude around the country come Christmas. Absolutely right. What's happened to the health and safety emails, Alison? Have we had any of those lately? We've had so many. We brought them to a temporary halt, didn't we? Because we got so many wonderful emails about childhood before health and safety. But we have to read out. This is a letter on actual paper which came to us from Keith in Leeds. And this is Keith's memories. In 1959, my friend and I, George was his name, both nine years of age, saved up and bought an enormous bonfire night rocket. We tied it to George's brother's tricycle. Both of us got on it and lit the fuse. We then sped down a steep hill in the grounds of Lord Chance's estate in Carlisle. We roared down the path. The idea being that when it levelled off, we would take off. (laughs) Unfortunately, the rocket exploded and threw us off the tricycle. My wellies melted and stuck to my skin. The shaft of the rocket went into the back of George's leg and the grass 20 yards around us was on fire. (laughs) It goes on. (laughs) A man in his back garden witnessed this event and called an ambulance and the fire brigade. We ended up in hospital where they removed the rocket shaft from George's leg (laughs) and managed to peel the remains of the wellies from my burnt and tender skin. This was at the beginning of the space race when everybody wanted to fly. It all seemed like a good idea at the time. We both survived, even though we were both grounded for a month. Thank you, Keith, for that absolutely oh, brilliant, own stuff. brilliant absolutely contribution. Fantastic. So that's it. Voyage number 17 to Planet Normal is now completed. As we approach planet Earth, strap yourself in for some turbulence and watch out for those mainstream news broadcasts. They may lead to outrage, depression and spiralling blood pressure. Remember that every Thursday at 11am after the release of each new Planet Normal podcast, co-pilot Halligan and I chat to fellow residents of Planet Normal. That's you, listeners, via the Telegraph website. Just go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash community, click on the article at the top of the page and leave a comment in the comments section. Between 11am and noon on Thursdays, we will reply to them with a bit of banter as well. Please come and join us. It's a lot of fun and reassures you there is some sanity out there somewhere in the cosmos. We are not alone. Email us with your thoughts on today's show or anything else, planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk and do tell others about the show. Anyone who might want to hear news and views from beyond the bubble. If you're enjoying the podcast, do please leave us a five-star rating and maybe a short review on Apple Podcasts. Any questions about podcasts, how to listen, where to find the good ones, check out our very useful article explaining all things podcasts on the Telegraph website. You'll find the link in the show notes to this episode. So thanks as ever as Planet Normal fades away into the distance and Earth hoves into view to our producers Louisa Wells and Elliot Lampett and our editor Theo Leloudis. So until our next voyage, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs>